Hello, my name is Martin Papworth. I'm an archaeologist who works for the National Trust. And the area I cover is really from uh, the Worcestershire border, things like Hidcote, property up there, and then west as far as the Killerton Estate in Devon, and southeast uh, to the Isle of Purbeck, Corf Castle, and Studland. But today I'm going to talk to you about Chedworth Roman Villa <clears throat> and some of the really exciting stuff that we found there recently. So um, I'll share my screen with you and show you some slides. So uh, Right, well, I've been working at uh, Chedworth with um, Nancy Grace, my colleague, and uh, a lot of other people, and lots of really good volunteers and other members of National Trust staff. And um, we've been working there for about 10 years. Um, and in that time, we've found a lot of new things. I won't be telling you about all of those things today. I'll start with a bit of an introduction to the place. Um, and then I'll be talking about Chedworth in its wider landscape and bring in the latest thing that's just come out, which is the LIDAR coverage, which we've just purchased, which shows some really interesting stuff underneath the trees in the surrounding landscape. And then I'll finish by talking about the end of Chedworth. How long was there a villa here for? Um, and, and that I think um, will be particularly exciting. So everyone who comes to the villa, and the, one of the nice things about working at Chedworth is that there are lots of visitors, lots of people passionate about archaeology in the Roman period. And they always ask us, well, you've worked so hard here. What were the names of the people who lived here? What sort of people were they? Um, and really, we, all we can really say to that is that they were very wealthy. But um, some of the things they left behind meant that they had serious cash. And, um, and it's one of the the best villas in the country, both to visit and in its, um, its scale of wealth that it shows. So here is a reconstruction drawing um, of a family who might have lived here. And whether these were local Gloucestershire people made good, or whether they were incomers from the wider empire, or perhaps a retired Roman officer, um, or someone from the politics, of Britannia at the time. We just don't know. But um, we must always remember that these were people um, and this was a community and they weren't isolated. They were part of a wider community um, of the Colne Valley and the land around Sirencester. Uh, so uh, it's always good, even if we can't answer those questions that we're always constantly thinking about them. So here is a reconstruction of Chedworth. It lies at the end of a valley facing east. Um, there's a spring in one corner of it. Hopefully you can see my cursor. It's the Nymphaeum, where the spring is. And you've got the North Range on this side and the West Range over here and the partially excavated South Range, which is lower down and out of the main sunlight. So we always imagine that that's the area. Uh, which was more to do with the service in part of the building, where the servants might have lived, where there would have been storehouses, kitchens, that kind of thing. And in this reconstruction, you've got a gateway here and uh, a lower courtyard um, and then steps leading up to an inner courtyard where all the posh rooms were. Um, and we'll be looking at it in more detail later on. So it all starts, as far as history is concerned, with um, Lord Eldon and his uncle, James Farrer. And one of their estate workers on the Stowell Park estate um, was out ferreting in the woods, um, lost his ferret down a hole, uh, which turned out to be a hypercaust um, for a Roman villa. So he came back, told Lord Eldon, who told his uncle, and um, he was an antiquarian and very excited. So in 1864, he excavated the villa, as we see it today. Uh, but um, we have one few, just one uh, publication, a uh, few notes from a talk he gave to the Scottish Antiquarian Society in 1865. Um, and all our information about that excavation really comes from there. We've got no drawings and we've got no photographs from that time. 
but in the next few years they they covered the best mosaics with uh, little sheds wooden sheds and and then um, reburied the other mosaics which they couldn't show and uh, and then built a lodge in the grounds of uh, Chedworth Roma Villa in the centre and uh, a museum off to one side where the finds were placed. So by 1868 that was all done and this is and pretty much what we see today is uh, what they left us with in 1868. So there's the lodge there with my cursor is, there's the museum as it's shown, the north wing, the west wing and the part of the south wing that was excavated as it continues underneath the, the soil here and this part is still um, undiscovered we don't know we presume there's a whole series of rooms here just one small excavation here in 1980s and the 1990s shows there are rooms right parallel with the north wing up here our uh, one clue our uh, one clue of who might have lived there and what their names were was uh, a spoon a silver spoon found in the west range which says Censorine Gaudius, Censorinus, uh, may you take joy in this. Um, but that spoon's now lost. But it's one personal name that we found in all the work that's been done here since the 1860s. So here's the same slide showing where we excavated from 2010 through to 2018. Here in the corner is the nymphaeum where the water source is, as I said earlier. This is all the work we did for the West Range, so that extra mosaics that were uncovered in the 1860s could be shown under a brand new cover building. Um, so um, yes, from 2010 to 2012 we were here, and from 2013 to 2018 we worked in the North Range. And um, it's the work in these rooms, 27 and 28, I'll be particularly talking about at the end of this talk. Um, we were rather hoping to have another cover building over the North Range, but the money hasn't been found for that. So we've done a lot of recording work so we can improve our interpretation of this part of the villa. So I came here in 2009, and you can see from here, Chedworth Roman Villa Lodge, completed in 1868, and under, between the twigs of the tree here, you can just make out the museum that is built off to one side. So this flight of steps takes you from the lower courtyard to the upper courtyard, um, but actually this mound of soil in the front is all the spoil from the 1860s excavation. So uh, the lodge is built on a spoil heap, basically, and so is the museum. This trench was dug in about 2000 and there it showed you the depth of the colluvial soil that's built up in the valley bottom um, over many thousands of years. And two metres down in this excavation they found a crouched Iron Age person, so Middle Iron Age. So although we've hardly found very, very, very much about anything that might have predated the Roman period, there is this Iron Age burial, and as we dug out the earlier layers at the villa, we have found fragments of late Iron Age pottery. So many villas have an Iron Age beginning, and, um, and it may be possibly that there is one at Chedworth, but there's only scant evidence, but a little. So this is a summary of our West Range work for the new cover building, as I talked about earlier. Um, and uh, this is what the Victorians left us, these two wooden sheds built up over the dining room mosaic, the best mosaic at this end, and at the other end, the bathhouse mosaics. Um, this was just looked like a tarmac path, and it was a tarmac path until 2010, where we peeled up the tarmac, cleaned back the top so the Victorians left behind and created this, um, well, we didn't create, it felt like we created this mosaic floor, uh, which is a beautiful thing and runs 30 metres from one end to the other end of the West Building. And here you can see there's a flight of steps that's actually built off the mosaic. This is a, an original flight of steps to the to villa, um, and, uh, but it is built over the earlier villa floor. So it, is, um, it, it does demonstrate that the hypercourse were put in later 
and to to create to take you from the ground surface up to the upper levels where the hypercost floors were in put in, put in um, these steps were put in place and similarly there are others at this end as well where the bathhouse is so here is the kind of thing we wanted to recreate in the cover building um, so people didn't think it was two things a path in front of proper rooms that there would be a building that covered all the mosaics and all the west range would be under one building so here is the floor i showed you earlier here uh, the dining room mosaic the, the path leading into the dining room a uh, little parlor here another little ga a little path leading to these rooms and then all the bathhouse rooms over here too so quite a nice little group of mosaics which you can see when you go there um, all under this this new for 2012 cover building at Chedworth but as I say most of what I'm talking about is going to be about the north range and that is um, still uncovered and there are mosaics under this area too so this is the same view imagine the servant walking in this direction and uh, looking back towards the west range through the columns of the north range gallery looking back towards the west range so we are now going to be looking in in the, the excavations through here as i say we started off in 2013 in the bathhouse here looking at some of the, the material that was excavated by Sir Ian Richmond in the 1960s. A lot of his records were lost. Um, we don't have a lot of information. Uh, we just have some of his interpretive walling that he put in. So we excavated some of those to see and take photographs of what he was interpreting. This is room 24. So that's this room here. And the wall we're going to look at is just there. So what you see at Chedworth today is the late fourth century villa at its very peak. Um, but of course, it started small and grew through time. And our earliest um, structural remains date from the early second century. And it seemed that these are narrower walls and they all are fire reddened as you see these examples here and they follow different alignments to the later walls built over the top of them so here you have a flue to a caldarium hot room heating for a bath but you can see even then that one blocked another flue here so there's more than one phase in this earlier um, phase of the villa and we know that that was early second century from the pottery remains that we find associated with them so that's our beginning the villa burnt down presumably it was a timber frame on top of stone footings and then a new villa was built over the top of that so we get an idea of a villa starting in the early second century running through to the end but when was that end it's always been imagined at the end of the fourth century, the place was abandoned. But increasingly, as you look at, as villas are examined um, across the country, we're getting an idea that there is something that carries on beyond that. So this gives you an idea of the setting of Chedworth at the end of this valley and how hard it is to see what lies beneath the trees because there's a lot of woodland around. In fact, the whole of this area was covered in woodland, as I said when the villa was first discovered. It was cleared in the 1860s. So how can we see what's beneath? And very, very recently, we've actually got some LIDAR coverage of this area. So I'm sharing this with you for the first time. So here we are without the trees. There's Chedworth Villa down here. The North Range that way. Here's the valley running down and you can see We've done geophysics in here and you can see the pathway leading to the villa straight from this direction here. This mound here we've geophysed and we found out that it's um, a structure. In fact, years ago when it was ploughed, there were fourth century coins and building rubble coming out from this mound. So it may be that this is some kind of temple shrine or a, a pavilion of some sort. There's another little bit of building up here. 
So perhaps we're imagining quite a landscaped approach to the villa to wow guests as they approach through the gateway at the lower courtyard down here and then up towards the inner courtyard. There's the Nymphaeum there, there's the North Range, there's the West Range. And here's a clue underneath the trees that there may be an Iron Age origin to this place because there's a ditch and a bank in here and traces of another one running down through here. So this LIDAR has given us great potential to understand the landscape more. And there's another path that runs up here and runs up the side of the villa and bypasses it to the white way that runs up through here. So yes, the more you look at this, the more interesting the landscape around Chedworth becomes. So is Chedworth just an ordinary villa? Or is it something more grander than that? Um, and uh, here are some comparative villas. So you recognize from the LIDAR, this is Chedworth down here. And here's Woodchester with its great mosaic here. <clears throat> um, um, that lies quite close by. Great Whitcomb, also in Gloucestershire, only a few miles away from Chedworth. North Lee, a little bit further away, near Oxford. And this one, big Naroma Villa in Sussex, another very grand villa, but more distant. It's true to say that the area around Sirencester has the greatest and wealthiest concentration of villas in the country. It just goes to show that this uh, was a very good place to live. In fact, by the fourth century, Sirencester uh, was Britannia prima capital. It was, there was, Britannia had been broken up into four provinces and the largest and the westernmost is Britannia prima. And uh, it was the second uh, largest settlement in the fourth century to London. And here are the roads coming out from there. And you can see some of the villas. There's Woodchester we looked at over there, Great Whitcomb. Turkdean is a villa that's been found um, relatively recently since this map was done. Withington, just up the way, has a plus one after it. There's another time team uh, dig, found another villa close by, which we'll look at in a minute. So yes, this is a busy place. And I'm going to, my next slide will be a focus in on the Chedworth area. To say something about, if this was a wealthy area, the area around Chedworth seemed even more concentrated. So there's the Foss Way again, heading out this direction towards Borton and the Water. And over here is the River Colne, winding its way through here. And you can see there are villas in this landscape. There's one here. There's Chedworth. Another one here, possibly. I'll look at that in a minute. And two more up here. Lots of building remains up here in Yanworth Wood. There's a, a temple site down here. So yes, lots of, lots of um, building and villa evidence concentrated here. So let's look at the LIDAR. So this is the same area with LIDAR. This is the old uh, railway that's now abandoned, it runs through here. But you can see clearly the valley of the River Colm coming through here. There's the temple I talked about, the site in Yanworth Wood, Chedworth. You can see the, how the valleys run through. And there are concentrations of what look like villas in these valleys and alongside the river as it winds its way through. <clears throat> I'll come back to Cathy Compton here. Compton Grove, we're looking at in a minute, and Withington. Let's look at Withington. So it's uh, just to the northwest of Chedworth. Discovered in the early 19th century, there's a picture of it um, and some of the mosaic that's being uncovered uh, by Lyson at that time, Samuel Lyson's. Time team went there and did a piece of work in 2006. Um, you can see the, the approximate footprint of Withington Villa as it was then. Um, and, uh, and 200 years of ploughing had not done this very well. Um, there, there was not so much left of it. But the other side, the one they were just had a, a few scattered bits of pottery down, um, showed up very well. It was thought to be a bathhouse beside the River Colne, but actually it is another villa in its own right. So why are there two villas so close together? 
Once again, you see the geophysical survey, lots of pits and irregular shaped ditches forming an enclosure. It does seem to indicate that this is um, an Iron Age settlement and the villa is focused on something that predates the Roman period. So excitement, what does our LIDAR show? Well, not very much really, there's a hollow here. This is the time team area down by the River Colne and very, very faint traces of something in the arable field here showing where the, other, the, the early 19th century discovery was made. So a bit disappointing for LIDAR as far as that's concerned. But um, let's have a look at um, this one, Cassie Compton. Now, you may have noticed on the Ordnance Survey map, this is shown as village earthworks. Um, but um, it doesn't look, a look, if it's some kind of deserted medieval village, it doesn't look like that at all uh, when you look at it on the LIDAR. So let's compare it with Chedworth. So here's the LIDAR for Chedworth Roma Villa with the Nymphaeum in the corner. And here is the earthwork at Cassie Compton. Yeah, well, that looks like a nice range, doesn't it? Running down through there, much like this would have looked like. That's the West Range. Um, there's the North Range. This looks like a North Range here. A little circular thing here. There's a lot going on in here. The, the, the river, Colne, runs this direction. At a later period, they've cut a trench right through perhaps to feed a, a mill further up the stream, stream or something like that. And you can see the edges of wall being highlighted as they're washed out on the edge of the stream as it goes through. So I think this is a real triumph for LIDAR and this has only just come up, so very exciting. A busy landscape full of interest um, and uh, far more to be discovered around Chedworth. So we, Chedworth we know very well compared to these other sites. And I'm going to talk to you now about the piece of work we did in room 27 and room 28. And we're looking particularly now of how long did these villas last for? If there's a place in Britain where Romanization continued longer, then it surely should be in the West, in the most Roma Romanized part of the West, around Sirencester, where there's so much wealth um, shown in, in these villa sites. So yes, here, is our trench. We're in August 2017. This was going to be our last year and in this year we were going to try and date some of the rooms and find something about what survived of the floor surfaces through here um, so that we can, we can get a better understanding of this part of the villa. Um, now these little black blobs are the dig carried out by Cotswold archaeology as part of the Chedworth mosaic survey. So this one, and this one, and this one, they showed traces of mosaic in this room. So in 2017, we decided to um, see how much of this villa, this mosaic survived in this room. And by this time, we realized that the money wasn't going to be found in the short term for our new cover building. And we'd already decided that it's quite, it was a really useful thing to do to uncover, the Victor, take the Victorian topsoil off and laser scan, uh, photogrammetrically survey in high resolution the mosaic. So if they couldn't be seen in reality, they could be seen virtually. So that's the plan. That's the National Trust plan for these rooms. So in 2017, we uncovered the whole of room 28, as well as date, trying to date rooms by these little trenches in the corner. So this is the trench excavated in the northeast corner of room 27. We're looking across the wall to room 28. Uh, just see the mosaic starting to come up there. Um, and what we found in this room was that there hadn't been a mosaic in this room, but there had been an opus signinum floor. And you can see the, the, the crushed brick and mortar surface just surviving in the strip at the very northernmost edge. The rest of the room and the floor that had been lost had been based on this hard core that runs right up against the wall through here. It's a mixture of limestone, gravel and mortar. And uh, we left most of that, but we just took a small piece of the hard core out um, and found that because this is the upper end of the room where the 
north ranges cut into the valley slope that at this level the natural bedrock is quite shallow so we've got uh, that's the Cotswold limestone brash that is the bedrock mixed with clay and it's cut here by a foundation trench for this wall and you can see that the wall is abutting this one so this is an older wall uh, but the open signal floor runs up against this wall as does the hard core and then before all that is the foundation trench and uh, there again there's looking north there's the earlier wall there's the wall that abuts it there's the offset for this is this uh, most recent wall here and here is the foundation trench filling so from this foundation trench filling we found two fragments of bone and a um, one fragment of pottery and lots of little twigs charcoal twigs which we collected in a bag and took away we thought that uh, it would be a good idea because in previous research there hadn't been a huge amount of pottery in, in good contexts. We thought it would be good to take radiocarbon dates from our foundation trenches as we dug these trenches. So we took samples whenever we could, we had the material to do that. And on the other side of the wall was the exciting stuff going on, the uncovering of the mosaic um, bit by bit the uh, mosaic was revealed uh, a really beautiful uh, pattern uh, unfortunately it only survived in the northern part of the room but we also dug another trench in the southeast corner of room 27 um, so looking southeast so room 28 where the mosaic is is just beyond this wall this is the interesting wall that we're talking about and you can see that here is the earlier wall that frames this the main rooms of this north range and look how it's you know here the, the valley slope is is quite steep going down to the bottom of the valley so the, the clay and limestone brash is much deeper here to make a level floor from the northeast end of the room you have to put a lot of topsoil and rubble down to create it create a nice level surface um, so here you've got this wall abutting this wall and this is beautifully dressed stone going down at least 10 courses there's the foundation trench for this wall there's the abutting of this wall here um, reasonably roughly dressed offset stones here well it's just junk underneath isn't it it's all rubbly piggledy piggledy a bit of tile thrown in so it's a different quality of wall altogether which is interesting is another view of it these are all the deposits of material used to level the room and in that material was predominantly second century pottery cut by the foundation trench for this wall. So here is a drone shot. So there's the northeast trench here, where, the, where we took the sample for this wall. Here is the southeast trench, um, and we took a sample from this foundation trench for this south wall of the north range. Here you see the extent of the, of the mosaics here. And you can see that the inside has been really badly worn away. There's odd fragments of mosaic elsewhere, but not much. And, um, and you've got these halves in here. Uh, this one's made out of reused box flue tile with a limestone curb. Here's another one. It's made of a reused fragmented quern stone and, not, and an arrangement of tiles quite badly worn. There's an area of burning here, there's another burning area of burning through here, there's some limestone rubble thrown down over here. So this was our theory. This wall was inserted in the late fourth century. It abutted, the, you know, it subdivided a larger room. And after that was put in, this late fourth century mosaic would have been created. Perhaps this was some kind of summer dining room or something like that. And then when the building started to fall, around, fall apart, it wasn't a polite place to dwell anymore. This room was reused as a workshop of some kind, probably in the fifth or sixth century. Um, and these halves were put in and some kind of um, industrial use, which involved burning. There was no slag found here, nothing to indicate hammer scale for a smithing workshop. So something that involved heat 
that's more already the center of this room. This was our theory. And the following year, we uncovered the whole of the great reception room here and the corridor in front of rooms 20, 26, 27, down to the end of the North Range. And we, um, we found that this large mosaic was really quite a, you know, an Orpheus style mosaic of the later fourth century. This mosaic was different. It seemed more um, pretty good, but it wasn't quite the same quality. And here is our view of you after the photogrammetric survey showing this 18 meter long and six meter wide uh, mosaic, one of the largest mosaics in the country that we know of so far. Um, and the threshold stone from the public space as a hall reception area through the, the door, the green door, green baize door into the gallery corridor leading to the private rooms of the owning family. Most interesting about this is you must imagine that in, these, in the 1860s, they took away everything down to the mosaic, but they missed a bit here. So a lot of what we want to find has been lost. You know, we're taking Victorian material off the surface of the Roman. Uh, but in this area, in the south of this room, we did find rubble. The rubble that accumulated on top of the, of the, of the mosaic. And here we could stratigraphically collect this material. And in it, we found Saxon pottery, stuff we called late Roman Shelley ware, and also a Theodosian coin. And very, very late fourth century coins. So we get an idea of, of when this the building was actually falling apart. So anyway, we click through to 2019. We've taken the phone, the, the, we're in Wiltshire now. We've taken the finds back to uh, Phillips House near Dinton, uh, not far from National Trust uh, Regional Office at Tisbury. And this is where we have our finds collections and processing area, processing area. Nancy Grace, our, uh, I find specialist um, uh, is doing all the post excavation work. And we found, um, we selected our, our uh, samples to send away for radiocarbon dating. This, these are the finds from the foundation trench for our um, room 27 wall, south wall of that room that, that runs through into the uh, room 28. And in this foundation trench, we find this pottery here, which is black burnished ware, inverted rim bowl. I would have said it was later second century. Um, and what does our radiocarbon date come back as? Yeah, well, it comes, the, the central part of it is sort of mid to late second century. So no real surprise from the uh, charcoal we got in the foundation trench for that wall. So, pretty much as expected you think well is it worth taking radiocarbon dates from from foundation trenches of roman villas when you've got such nice pottery um one might think that so anyway we um we now have the radiocarbon date from the wall dividing rooms 27 from room 28 and this is when we got a bit excited it wasn't quite what we expected uh this piece of charcoal beneath the hardcore um of the open signinum floor in the foundation trench, uh, the earliest it could possibly be, using a 95.4% probability, was uh, 424 AD. In fact, if you were being really optimistic, it could have been put in in 544 AD. It's most likely to be somewhere in between, 470, 480 perhaps. Um, were the Romans building walls in the late fifth century? So this was quite, but the thing is that if they were building this wall then, as the mosaic fits tightly within that room and it's an intricate design, then the mosaic has to be of this state or later than this. So no, no, hang on though, because it, we noticed that in that room, it, you know, typically it had been quite badly worn. It had been, the place had been falling apart and someone had picked up some rubble from around and created these two halves in there, which had um, caused some sort of industrial work 
that wore away the mosaic in the middle. So these, of course, are typical 5th, 6th century, aren't they? Well, these are our radiocarbon dates from inside the box flue tiles, the really burnt material inside the box flue tiles of that, that um, southern of the two um, halves. And as you can see, these are actually medieval. You know, they're sort of late 12th to late 13th century or possibly 15th century, but they're certainly nowhere near um, sub-Roman not 5th, 6th or 7th century. So yes, this is unexpected. And so how can we place that within the wider villa? So when we were working in the West Range, uncovering the middle part of the, um, the villa, um, of this gallery here, we found that uh, when we got to the doorway in the centre of the West Range, we found that the mosaic, this lovely mosaic floor, had been worn away um, and hadn't been repaired. In this area, there had been a, quite a nice threshold pattern here, but it had been completely worn away. You can see it being patched at different times. There's a, there's a bond here, there's a change in here as well. But in the end, they didn't bother to repair it. In fact, here they've just shoved in bits of mosaic and put a bit of soil on top. And here they've put this sort of hard clay uh, material mixed with um, pink grog tempered ware. Stephen Koch, the mosaic specialist who advises us, reconstructed this threshold mosaic from the West Range corridor and this is what it would have looked like originally. And you can see some of the repairs here. So we don't have any date from when that patching took place, but it's quite clear that people for a long time were coming in through this doorway and turning particularly in this direction towards the Nymphaeum and the North Range bathhouse. So it does indicate in the West Range there's a period of decline and not uh, proper repair to the mosaic here. The other thing that we need to look at is work that was done. I said that most of the South Range had never been excavated. Well, this piece down here was. Uh, we can assume that there are rooms stepping down into this lower area all the way along here, much as the North Range range of rooms. And in 1997 and 2000, work here uncovered the corridor for the South Range. And in there, there was um, a heated corridor. Yeah, evidence that Phil Bethel found of a heated corridor, but later still, there'd been rubble collapse and um, there'd been a, um, a pit dug, which might've been a um, corn dryer with lots of carbonized grain in it. And we did a radiocarbon date on that carbonized grain. And that carbonized grain came back much the same as the, the, the twigs from the foundation trench for the North Range Room 27. So yes, definitely, you know, work was going on in these rooms, things were happening, um, but perhaps we're looking at a villa that is that is where the, the polite rooms are being concentrated. That um, whereas these may be no longer used as uh, residence areas, they may be more to do with um, store storage. In, you know, or they may be places for um, agricultural work, um, corn drying. Who knows? All these kinds of things. They're more farm buildings, um, barns, that kind of thing. Whereas here, there is still, um, whoever owned this place still had a place um, which was a, a good Romanized place to live. So you're thinking, well, yes, what other evidence do you have, Martin, of this, um, of this late, this, right, this idea that Chedworth was carrying on much later into the fifth and probably the sixth century too. Well, we have been looking at all the past excavations, all the finds from the museum, everything that's been done back to the 1860s and analyzing the pottery. And Jane Timby and Rachel Seeger have looked at the pottery from the various excavations and they've come up with some quite interesting ones. So uh, here we're getting imported amphorae. 
Um, so you've got the sorts of things that are found in quite a lot down in the southwest in places like Tintagel being traded in from Byzantium. It's finding its way up to Chedworth um, in the 5th and 6th centuries. So you've got Palestinian sherds of amphorae found here in the upper courtyard. Um, and you've got uh, another piece of amphorae from Asia Minor, so the coast of Turkey. Um, and over here in the corner of the room 32 in the North Range, you've got um, another piece of, piece of amphorae from Cyprus, another piece from Turkey. The other things that we found um, in room 27 in 2000, a whole late Roman shellyware pot was being set into a pit in the floor of room 27. Um, and here, I told you a piece of pottery was found in our foundation trench in room 27. That's late Roman shellyware as well. Other fragments were thrown back when the Victorians uh, uh, put the backfill over the top of room 27. More we found um, in room 25B, both in 2014 and 2018. And then we have references of it being found in 1954 down here, other fragments up here by the Nymphaeum, found by Ian Richmond. And the other things you see here are grass tempered um, and sand tempered Saxon pottery, which we found in various places. So these fragments of pottery are, um, show that the place is occupied. Late Roman Shelleyware has not been found before 360. And uh, so all these fragments must be at least after 360. And for the fragment I found in our foundation trench, it had to be used, dropped, broken, put into the trench, um, ball built, the mosaic laid. So yes, they are good in evidence of fifth century occupation. We found more late Roman Shelleyware in a, in a stone drain that we excavated on this side and also against a, a boundary wall up here. So basically there is a lot of evidence that people were living here late on, both from the imported amphorae that has to come an awful long way and to have it here does indicate that someone had some wealth to purchase and have it transported and to, and to consume it here at Chedworth Roman Villa. And then we have these mosaics um, so this is this is the corridor mosaic um, in the North Range, and it's more evidence that all these late phase mosaics are all concentrated in this North Range. So room 28, this one, and another one at the east end of the North Range. Uh, they're all, all like this, and they're quite nice, uh, but unusual. It's interesting you've got they're almost negative and positive Im images. These pairs of these little motifs in hopscotch style as they run up through here. And this fire one almost looks like a Celtic spiral. Unfortunately, this runs for about 50 meters, this corridor, but it only survives at this west end. So looking at this area again, you wonder, don't you, how many other fifth century mosaics might be out there or evidence for Romanized continuity in the Sirencester landscape? Certainly, there have been excavations in Sirencester that have demonstrated later occupation there. Um, the Beaches excavation in particular um, was uh, found uh, later phases of construction there. Places like Gloucester and Sirencester are probably the places where markets where these Byzantine amphora were actually sold. And there's a place like Hucklecott, for example, although it hasn't been proved there was a, a, a mosaic that late, um, there was a coin of 395 AD found on the mortar bedding where mosaic had been eroded away. So there's another indication there that when that mosaic was put in place, it was after 395 AD. So very exciting. I think that pe the period after the Roman Romans withdrew their administration from Britannia. Those hundreds of years up to the time which we call um, the later Saxon period, this is a particularly exciting time and there's a huge amount to be discovered from it. 
a lot to be thought about. And part, part of the excitement, I think, of archaeology is to try to puzzle and to work out what happens when a high level of civilization declines. How do populations cope? Where do they go through? How do they adapt? And how do they merge with the Angles, the Saxons, the Frisians, the Jutes, who are coming in from the east? Well, I hope you've enjoyed that. And um, look, I hope you enjoy the rest of this conference. Goodbye, it's been nice talking to you. Bye-bye.